May I invite us to open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. We'll be looking at verses 23 through chapter 11, verse 1. Just a few short verses. While you're turning there, let me introduce our subject, honoring God. Whatever we do ought to be done that it honors the Lord. Uh, perhaps you've heard the story of the young lad out on the front lawn one Saturday watching his dad wash the automobile. Back a number of years ago, there was a television commercial advertising camel cigarettes, less than 100 years ago. And that was the picture, the image. The father washing the car, he was smoking his cigarettes. He walked over and placed the pack of cigarettes on the front porch as he continues to wash. His son goes over and gets one, and while it is unlit, yet nevertheless he puts it in his fingers and starts acting just like his dad. Mimicking dad, following dad. Whatever we do, every place we go, whatever we do or say, ought to be that which honors the Lord, realizing that others are watching. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the text that is before us. Stand, if you will, please, as I read audibly, follow with me in your scripture. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 23 through chapter 11, verse 1, which is the unit of thought. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. And that wealth simply means welfare, benefit. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the, Lord, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye dispose to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man, another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? For that which I give thanks. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Thank you, and we may be seated. I believe much too often we, even among Christians, show what I call a selfish personality. We do what we want, when we want how we want, and the mindset and the philosophy is, it's my life, never mind what others think, say, or do. And by the way, sometimes that is a little bit obvious in what we're doing in relationship to serving the Lord, because many times the world rejects what we're doing. And that does not mean in that realm that we're to stop what we're doing in honoring God. That still honors the Lord. But I want us to understand we make decisions about what we're going to do rather than how it looks for others, what we're wanting to do. We're saying it's our liberty, it's our freedom, that we can do as we please. But what do others say? What do others think? How does, impact, how does it impact the lives of others? We should be governed in our actions, in our decisions, not just simply by what we want to do, but what is good for others as we honor God in their presence. And that simply means we're to be a witness, realizing that others are seeing us, watching us, and mimicking our lives in what they do and what they say. Christians especially have a responsibility to those whom we work with, live with, live beside, etc. Paul, here in this text, by the way, the context of it, the Apostle Paul is still dealing with the meat offered to idols in pagan worship. He introduced the subject, as you recall, back in the 8th chapter, and off and on he's touched on it again with a common thread through several of these chapters. Our liberty in Christ must be controlled by our commitment to first and foremost honoring the Lord in what we do, honoring him, giving glory to him, 
There are three things in this text that I want us to look at briefly in these moments that we have together. I want us to notice the selfless principle revealed in verses 23 and 24. Secondly, I want us to notice the social practices restricted in verses 25 through 30. And thirdly, I want to see the single purpose reminded in verse 31 and through chapter 11 and verse 1. Notice, first of all, in verse 24 and 25, the selfless principle revealed. We see in verse 23 what I call the moral conviction, the moral conviction. The apostle Paul says, all things are lawful, literally allowable, permitted. Now, keep in mind, as Paul is talking in this text, he's not talking about those things that are stated in the Scripture as not being allowable for a Christian. He's not talking about those things that the world will do that the Christian ought not to do. He's not saying that all things, that is, all in every sense, that which is right and that which is wrong, that's not what he's saying at all. All things are lawful, literally permissible, uh, permissible, allowable uh, for me, but all things are not expedient. That is useful or beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. That is, all things that I could do do not build up the body, do not honor the Lord. And the whole theme that Paul is talking about here is whatever we do, whatever we say, ought to honor God in our lives. Paul is saying, I have liberty in Christ. I have freedom in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I have that freedom to do whatever the Bible permits me to do. That's what he's saying. Whatever the Word of God, the law of God, whatever the law of God permits me to do, I have the authority and the freedom to do so. May I simply say, if we wanted to use that and carry it to the farthest extreme, we could say I could go boating, skiing, basketball, uh, football, fishing, etc., etc., on Sunday because I'm free to do so. But is that what honors God? Does it honor the Lord in our lives to do those things? All things that I may be free to do are not necessarily expedient, not necessarily beneficial, not useful in our lives or in the lives of those that are watching our walk, watching our witness, and watching our talk. And may I remind us, all things that we might have freedom to do, all things that we could do, do not build up the body, do not edify Christ in our lives. It takes a personal moral conviction about glorifying God, honoring God, and building up the body of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me just give you a few little uh, things that we could say in that realm. And I've just uh, uh, come up with a list of two, three, four, five things. Uh, I could say I'm a Christian and I can still uh, be a homosexual. You find that in society today. Well, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I can still love God. I can still my life uh, live my life as I please. But does it honor God when others see that and uh, perhaps walk in that same footstep saying that's what I'm going to do because my sister, my brother, my aunt or uncle, that's what they're doing, so therefore it's all right with me. Some might say, well, I can go to the beach and go half nude, and that's all right because I have the freedom to do so. But does it honor the Lord? Some would say, I can stay out of church. I can go if I want to. I can stay home if I want to. But the question is, does it edify Christ? Does it build up the body of Christ? Some will say, well, I can be saved and I can love the Lord and I can go drink with my buddies. I can go bar hopping with my buddies. I can go and smoke a joint or two with my buddies and it's all right. But others see that. Does it edify? Does it build up the body of Christ? Does it honor God? May I remind us, Children are following in the parents' footsteps. Many uh, sons and daughters today that have gone astray, it's because they watch mom and dad and they have modeled their lives after mom and dad and therefore mom and dad may get concerned and uptight, as I would call it, about what they're seeing, but the, perhaps the seed has already been sown, the model has already been molded, made, and it is an impossibility sometimes to see that reversal when we've done so. The question that should be asked before doing anything. These questions ought to be asked. Does it build up or tear down the body of Christ? Does it encourage or discourage others? Is it that which uh, can retard or advance spiritual growth in my life and the lives of others? Does it cause others to stumble and fall or does it build them up? Is the practice needful? Is it helpful? Is it beneficial in my life or in the lives of others? If we just use that little checklist, I think it would really make a difference in all of our lives. Our liberty should be exercised when it is profitable in honoring God. The question is, does it uh, cause help or hurt in the life of those that's watching our footsteps? It is uh, a difficult thing 
but oftentimes we see the end result when it is too late. The believer does not determine his behavior. The Word of God does. We may be free to do whatever we want to do, but is it that which honors God? Is it free in the body of Christ? Is it something that edifies and builds up other Christians? You may be free to go and to do or to say what you want and what you please. You may have the liberty, but it should be controlled by commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. Honoring God, glorifying Him ought to be the model that we set before others. The moral conviction, but I want you to notice in that 24th verse, the main concern. The main concern that the Apostle Paul identifies here, let no man seek his own, that is his own welfare, his own benefit, but every man another's welfare, benefit, or well-being. Paul said, don't seek to benefit self. Paul is saying that for the child of God, we ought to live a selfless life, a life that models a pattern and a lifestyle and a manner of living that pleases the Lord by lifting up others. Our main concern is deciding a matter, and that decision ought to be based upon, does it benefit me? Does it benefit others? Is it honoring God in what we do and what we say? We have liberties in Christ. But we are bond slaves to Jesus. We are, as I told our boys when they were growing up, we all should be a necros doulos. That's a dead slave. The Apostle Paul says he was a dead slave for Jesus Christ. That ought to be our life. That ought to be our mantra. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it says that the genuine love does not seek its own interest, but is selfless in its interest in serving the Lord. Our aim, our goal, our concern must be focused on building up the body of Christ, honoring God in what we do and what we say. Church attendance, helping in ministry, soul winning, giving freely in finances ought to be that pattern that we set that others see it, and when others see it, they want to model and mimic what we're doing because they're watching our lives and how we serve the Lord. Not only do we see the selfless principle revealed, But I want you to notice the bulk of the text in verse 25 through verse 30. The social practice is restricted. The Apostle Paul in these verses gives selected practices where individual concerns for others and building up the body is seen. He shows how selfless, the selfless principle is really to be put at work. Notice first of all in verse 25 and 26 what I call the meat market circumstances. The meat market circumstances, and I'm not talking about necessarily Winn-Dixie or Publix, uh, though it could have been if it had been in that setting in this day and era. Verse 25 and 26, previously, of course, Apostle Paul's already said that the Corinthian believers, uh, he says, do not join with cultic feast and uh, don't fellowship with demons, that is, uh, dining with demons. He's already said that in the previous unit of thought. He says, don't do that. And by eating meat, you're eating that meat that's been offered to idols, and we can't dine with demons. But I want you to notice what he says in this text about the meat market circumstances. Notice, first of all, the communication. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, and the term shambles was what it was called for the meat markets of that era, the Greek meat markets that were usually enclosures uh, that was usually next to or near the idol temples, uh, the temple enclosures of the idols, and that uh, uh, is where they would take the meat that was left over from offering it to the uh, idols, the false gods, in those temples, and would take it and put it in the shambles, the meat market. They didn't waste any of the meat. They would offer some to the idols, and the balance would go in the meat market to be sold. And the Apostle Paul is saying there in this text, for conscience sake, literally it may or may not have come from the animal sacrifice to the pagan idols, so don't bring the question up, is what he's literally saying. It may stir up the conscience of the one that you're eating with. He says, just buy it and eat it. Don't ask, where did it come from? Uh, Don't ask, did you get this? Where did this meat come from? Uh, Who butchered it? How is it uh, butchered? How is it packaged, et cetera, et cetera? If we'd ask those questions, we might not eat much that's in the meat markets today in our local shops even. In fact, uh, it is something that we ought to understand that sometimes it's better not to ask a question. Just a few years ago, here in our city, the citywide news was where they had gone into a Chinese restaurant on the north side, and discovered in the freezer were skinned cats. 
that they had been selling, uh, been marketing, merchandising in their Chinese food. Not too many years after we had moved to Jacksonville, over on San Jose Boulevard, a Chinese restaurant there at that time. Uh, they were going out in the uh, wild uh, geese and the ducks that were around the ponds and the pools of water. They were harvesting them, and they were selling duck soup in the Chinese restaurants. Uh, if you were asked for uh, the Chinese restaurant owner, what is this meat? It tastes pretty good. Where did it come from? He might get lockjaw. I don't know. But the scripture is saying, and the apostle Paul is giving the instruction, whatsoever is sold in the shambles in the meat markets, eat it, asking no questions for conscience sake. Listen, he's saying, don't sit down and wonder about it and discuss it. It can be bothersome to you, your conscience, and the conscience of the one that you're eating with. Notice the cause that he says, verse 26, for because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's saying, whatever you're eating, God created it, and because God created it, he owns it all. And Paul is here simply quoting Psalms 24, verse 1, where it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. In. The Apostle Paul, by the way, is quoting from the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus and the uh, disciples quoted over 300 times from the Old Testament. And yet, Andy Stanley says we ought to come unhitched from the Old Testament. Uh, let me just put a little tidbit in here. If we were to do that, we wouldn't understand 80% of the New Testament. If we were to do that, we wouldn't have any fundamental foundational beliefs to build on in the New Testament. If we would unhitch from the Old Testament, we would not have any of the moral laws. In fact, the Andy Stanley has also said uh, the Christian need not uh, uh, do anything about minding or obeying uh, the Ten Commandments. If that is the case, we can just toss everything that's called morals and ethics and values out the window in society today. But here in this text, the Apostle Paul is saying the lost pagan world, the false gods uh, worship that uh, they may feel his food is supplied by the cult gods as a result of the cultic practices and the shambles, the meat markets there. The believer knows that all that we have comes from the Lord. Listen, as I was growing up, we would have sometimes grits of a morning, and what was left went into the cupboard. It wasn't a refrigerator. It was a screen door cupboard that kept the flies out. We'd come in from school in the afternoon, and the leftover morning grits were there, and we thought we had a party when we were able to take that, pour it out, slice it up, and have squares of grits, sprinkle a little sugar on that, and you'd think your tongue's going to beat your brains out eating it because it's so delicious. We didn't say, Mom, this is all we've got. We don't want it. We didn't say, Where did it come from? We we're simply glad to have food that God had placed on the table for us to eat. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here to the believers. He's saying simply, buy it, cook it, thank God for it, and eat it. Kids today growing up in our families will argue about, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I don't want it. Never will forget a number of years ago when I was interviewing a, a husband and wife and daughter uh, about uh, enrolling the child in the academy. I simply asked mom and dad uh, in your home when you labor and prepare a meal and place the food on the table and the kids come sit at the table, do you have any of your children that ever says, mama, I don't want that. I don't like that. Okay, honey, that's all right. After we get through eating, we'll run down and get you a Burger King. You ever done that? And the mother said, yes. I said, mom, we can't enroll your child. That child's in control of the home, not you and dad. That's what we find so often in our society today where there's a mindset there's going to be a rebuttal and a rejection of what God has provided. The Apostle Paul is saying when you sit down to eat, even as Christians at Corinth, and keep in mind the believers at Corinth were mixed up, messed up, divided. There was division and discord in the church at Corinth. They were mixed up and messed up as a church. They didn't understand a lot of theological doctrinal truth. And the Apostle Paul in the text in 1 Corinthians is chiding them, condemning them, correcting them, for misunderstanding of biblical truth. And he's trying to get them to understand the false gods are here, the meat markets are here, the shambles where they sell in that meat market may or may not have been offered to the idols, but for conscience sake, don't ask the question. First of all, we find there as a result of that the meat market circumstances. Then we see the meal celebration in verse 27 and 28. Paul gives a second illustration of the principle that he set forth as selflessness. Notice what he says in 27. We see the curiosity. If any of them that believe not, that's talking about a lost person, the pagans, believe you 
bid you to feast with them, literally have a banquet, a celebration, and ye be disposed, that is, you desire, you want to go. Whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. He says, if you've got a next door neighbor that's a pagan, and that pagan invites you to come over and have dinner, do so, but you need to not ask a question because of conscience. We're in the world today, but we're not of the world. It's very clear in the scripture. Yet we cannot be segregated, separated from the lost world. We're in the world, but not of the world. As a result of that, we have, we rub elbows every day with the pagans in society, if you'd look at it in the specific sense of what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, if that takes place and your neighbor invites you, let's eat together and they're going to cook a meal for you, that lost person shows courtesy and invites you to a birthday party, let's say, a celebration, a banquet, and you're impressed that you need to go, and as you go, we need to honor God in doing so. I would say with a little young blood footnote on that, we need to still need to be very careful of what home we're going into and who we're going to participate in a meal together. He says, but don't ask where the meat was uh, originated. Don't ask how you got it. Don't ask where did the money, where did you get the money? Don't ask what you're going to do. How did you earn the income? Any, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just enjoy the meal is what Paul is saying for conscience sake. Notice not only the courtesy, but notice the curiosity in the 28th verse. The 28th verse says, But if any man say unto you, Listen, this is offered in sacrifice unto the idols. Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. He's reminding us that everything is from the Lord. But notice what he says. Paul says here, If the question arises... If he voluntarily says, oh, by the way, Charlie, uh, you and Susie, I'm glad you've come over to eat with me. I'm just so delighted. I bought this from the shambles yesterday, and I got a super good deal on these T-bone steaks. Uh, the Apostle Paul is saying, when that lost person announces where that meat came from, he is, and it was a sac- uh, uh, meal, uh, meat that was offered as a sacrifice to idols, the Apostle Paul says, don't eat the meat. Don't participate. If you do, literally what you're doing, you're participating in his celebration of that leftover meat that came from the offering to the idols in that temple worship. Paul is saying don't participate. Don't allow yourself to do so for conscience sake. What's the issue? What is the lesson? We must avoid causing that lost person to uh, be weakened in his faith and stumble and fall any further. We need to understand that if we... As Christians, someone were to say, let's go to the bar rooms to be a witness. And by the way, I'm using that as a real example of a number of years ago, a man in this city found no problem. He said, after all, I'm going there for the right motive. I'm going there for the right purpose. Going to the bar rooms and the lounges. He said, I'm going there to pass out tracts. I'm going there to witness. And one other preacher to go with him. And uh, uh, we need to look at that with very, very scrutinizing eyes and understand, what are you doing? You're saying that you're going there. Let's say that it's the right motive. God forbid, but it's the right motive. And someone sees you walking out of the bar room or the lounge or they see your car parked out front. What will be their thought? How will the stumble and the fall take place as a result of thinking that you're there and perhaps for the wrong motive, though you may have had the right motive in the heart. I don't recommend that at all. But nevertheless, that was an example based on a true story. I want us to understand our freedoms must be exercised with care and cautions. How will it affect the lives of others? How will it affect the lives of others? Some Christians have said, I can smoke, cuss, fuss, and act ugly. I'm still saved and it's okay. Is it okay? Is it all right when it affects the lives of others that are watching? Your life becomes an open book, an open witness to the world that is around us. Paul is saying if I do that, I need to do so and understand that I ought not to participate and uh, go into that because of the conscience sake of that weaker one, especially that lost one. If I stay home on Sunday, I might have that freedom to do so. How will it affect others? If I decide that I don't need to go to church, I'm still... There are a lot of folks today in 21st century America, more and more are dropping out of the church and saying, I can worship at home, just the same as at church. 
Never will forget a number of years ago having the opportunity to do pre-marriage counseling with a young couple. And uh, he, uh, the young man prayed the sinner's prayer to get saved. The young lady said she was already saved. Never mind the fact she never set foot in the door in the church. She said, I love fishing on Sunday, and I can worship God in that boat just as well as I can sit in the church. I said, oh, I'm sure you can. As you cast out that lure and you start watching that fish strike and you start reading him in, sure you're thinking about God. Sure you're thinking about worship. I just know that's so. We wound up that they decided they didn't want me to do the wedding ceremony, and that's all right. <laughs> I found that generally for pre-marriage counseling after the first one-hour session, most of the time they decide that they don't want that preacher to marry them because I don't cut any slack with what the Bible says and what ought to be done. And I let them know after the first three hours, three one-hour sessions, then I'll decide if I'm going to do the ceremony. They decided after the first one hour that they didn't want it. We need to understand that what we do in our lives affects the lives of others. We need to honor God in our lives and please him with whatever we say and whatever we are doing. If it's something that's questionable, we ought not to do it. Not only do we see the meat market circumstances and the meal celebration, but I want you to notice the mindful conscience in 29 and 30. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? That liberty meaning it's freedom. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which... I give thanks. Notice what Paul is saying, the mindful conscience. Conscience in verse 28, talking about the conscience of the weaker believer. Conscience in verse 29 is talking about the conscience of the lost man. Two different consciences spoken of here. Why is that so? Because it's the lost man that we are to be a witness to. It's the lost person that we are to reach out with the gospel. It's the lost man that's watching our lives saying, if he's saved, I don't want anything to do with salvation. And that's what's seen many times in many lives today. Many times in many lives, that lost individual will be watching your life and my life, and they'll say, I simply do not want to be saved if that's what a saved person acts like, talks like, and lives like. Now, that does not weaken or diminish or in any way circumvent our responsibility to take a stand. As a saved person, we need to take a stand for godliness and for honoring God, regardless of what the world might think or say about us. But that's not what Paul is talking about here in that sense. May I remind us we look at conscience in 29 in conclusion in verse 30. In verse 29, we must be very, very careful of our conscience. Why is that so? Conscience can be dulled, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. A conscience, a Christian might say, well, I've got a good conscience about it. I, my conscience doesn't bother me at all. Well, that may be because that conscience has been so dulled because of sin that you don't truly have a conscience that will guide you and direct you. Some say, well, let your conscience be your guide. That's a dangerous thing to do. Many times that conscience is so dulled and so destroyed that you do not understand right from wrong in the realization of what you ought not to do based on the word of God. But Paul says here, our conscience will bear witness of the work of the Holy Spirit. Our conscience will bear witness of the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15, it touches on that. Let me just read that. Which show the work of the law written in the hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the means while accusing or else excusing one another. The conscience can either accuse or excuse what an individual is doing based on their conscience and whether or not it's been dulled. It's the conscience. And then the conclusion, Paul says, Paul is saying, for, gar, because if I by grace, that is literally by thanksgiving, be partaker, why am I evil 
that is to be spoken of in a blaspheming way, derided, to be spoken of badly. Why am I spoken of? For that which I give thanks. The Apostle Paul here asked the question, verse 28, that why is my liberty, my freedom, adjudicated a judge to be determined or decided by someone else? Paul is saying, my life is lived in honoring Christ. My life is lived in pleasing God. So what I do, why should my uh, direction be determined by what a person's conscience might think or say that I ought to do. I've had those to say, well, you just want to judge, you just want to judge me. No, I'm adjudicating sin. I'm determining what you're doing in your life is unbiblical, it's unholy, it's ungodly, and ought not to be. But yet, as a result of that, we are so often evil spoken of, and that's what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying, why is it that when I do the right thing, I'm evil spoken of? He's trying to give the conclusive thoughts. He's saying, therefore, Gar, because if I by grace be partakers, why am I evil spoken for that which I have given thanks? The answer Paul accepts here is the food as a grace gift from God for which he's thankful we ought to give God thanks and praise for all that he provides. Paul is saying, God provided it, I'm thankful for it. How can others speak of me in an evil fashion? There are some today who watch every action of a true believer's life, searching for some little minuscule thing to accuse, abuse, and to mock, and to demean as a result of what we're doing in serving the Lord. Notice not only the selfless principle revealed and the social practice restricted, but notice in verse 31 and following, the single purpose reminded. The single purpose reminded. Paul here points out that uh, there ought to be one goal, one purpose, one aim as we serve the Lord. There ought to be that single-mindedness, that single aim, and that single purpose in your life and in mine. And that purpose ought to be to honor God in what we do and what we say and all that's carried out in our lives. Notice, first of all, the motive considered in verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, not talking about what the Bible condemns now, some will look at this and say, why, certainly, whether we eat or drink. And he, Paul is not talking about uh, alcoholic beverages. He's not talking about Bud Dummer and Miller Low Life. He's not talking about uh, uh, Jack Daniels. He's not talking about uh, that in the Scripture because there's over 100 verses in the Bible that says any participation in alcoholic beverages is no, 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 you can't do it as a believer. But he's saying, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory, the honor, the praise of God. Why do we do what we do? What's the motive behind what you do, or what I do? Why should we avoid causing the weaker brother to stumble? Our motive should be to honor God, giving God the glory, giving God the praise, giving God the recognition in honoring him in what we do and say in our lives. That should be why we do all that we do, not because of what I want or because of what you want, but because of what honors and pleases God in our lives. Where we eat, what we eat, what we wear, where we go, what we say, how we live our lives, all should be to the glory and the honor of God. It's beneficial. The question needs to be asked, is that beneficial? Is it uh, helpful? Does it enslave? Will it hinder my spiritual growth? Does it edify the body of Christ? Does it lift up the name of Christ? We need to think for a moment before we enter into some of the things that's done in society today. All that we do needs to be with that single aim and goal and purpose. Does it honor the Lord in our lives? Yes, we're free in Christ. Yes, we have liberty, but that liberty ought not to be used as license to harm the body of Christ, to cause the body of Christ to stumble and fall. We should have one single motive, and that's pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the motive considered. But notice the major concern in verse 32 and 33. Notice the scripture says, the constraint in verse 32, give none offense, and that offense means 
It's the little scandal on, uh, give none offense, don't cause anyone to stumble and fall. Do not block others as they walk for the Lord, neither to the Jews or to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Literally, the Apostle Paul is identifying the Jews, he's identifying the Gentiles, he's identifying the Christians. That is the total spectrum of all of society. He says, constantly in our lives, there ought to be the recognition of what we do, and as we're doing it, we ought not to do something that will cause anyone one lost or saved to stumble and fall because of watching or following in our footsteps. We should live, work, act, and talk in such a way that we would avoid any behavior that would cause another to fall. How are we practicing that? How are we impacting the lives of our sons and daughters? How are we impacting the lives of of our co-workers? How are we impacting the lives of our neighbors? How are we impacting the lives of fellow believers in Christ? By our actions and our deeds, what does it say? How do they view it? What is the sense of who we are in their eyes? Not only the constraint, but notice the conversion in verse 33. Notice what verse 33 says in relationship to that. Even as I please all men. And he's already talked about in chapter 9, verse 22, is going to become all things to all men that by all means he might win some. He says, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit or my own benefit, but the profit or the benefit of many that they may be saved. The apostle Paul says, that conversion, Paul is saying, my main concern is the life and the benefit of Christ in the lives of those that I impact with the gospel. My main concern, Paul says, is the conversion of the lost person, whether it be Jew or Gentile, whether it be one that's in the world or not. I'm concerned about winning others to Jesus Christ. May I simply say that if that were our motive, honoring God, as we honor God, we're going to want to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to want to see others come into the household of faith. We're going to want to see others being born again, blood-bought, and Bible-saved. What is the main concern? Getting by, making a living, getting ahead, keeping up with the Joneses. Why not focus on winning the lost? When we become burdened with the lost and when we focus on winning the lost, when we start seeking and reaching out for others, we will see real church growth in the body of Christ. That ought to be the major aim and the goal. The Apostle Paul says the conversion of others is primary in my heart and in my life. Notice not only the motive considered and the major concern, but I want you to notice in that 11th chapter in the first verse as we close, the modest command. Modest command. The Apostle Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Fascinating verse there. Be ye. Literally he says, You be followers. And that word follower simply means to mimic, to emulate, to be like. You act like me, talk like me, walk like me, preach and teach like me, serve the Lord like me, even as I am mimicking, following the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a powerful witness. Can you say that? Could I say that? Most of the time, we'll say to others, you need to live your life modeled after Christ. Because the Apostle Paul was so closely related, related to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He could say, follow me, mimic me, do as I do, say as I say, walk as I walk, because my walk, my talk is following, is mimicking Jesus Christ in my life. That's a powerful concluding remark. He says, I live in such a way. I walk in such a way, I talk in such a way, I do in such a way that I want you to simply follow me. That's what he's saying to the backwards, divided, dissension uh, group in the church that's called Corinth. He was saying, do as I do, follow my life because I'm following Christ. Paul says, let my life be your example. I want you to mimic me, follow me because I'm following, I'm mimicking Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul is saying, I'm not asking you to do anything that I've not done that I cannot do that I'm not now doing. Just simply do as I'm doing. If we're living a life to honor the Lord, 
surely we can say, mimic Jesus. But Paul says the real model in the modest command is to live in such a way that you could say to a friend, relative, or neighbor, you want to know how to live for Jesus? Follow me. You want to know what Christ wants for your life? Follow me. You want to know what the scripture says? Listen to me. You want to know where God would have us to go in life and what we're doing? Follow me. Follow in my footsteps. That's the model. That's the goal. That's the aim. That should be the purpose. That should be the example that we're trying to emulate in our own lives today. Paul is pointing men to Jesus Christ. He's saying, hey, listen up. Folks at Corinth, listen up. Follow me. Let me be your example as to how you live your life and what Christ would have you to do in living it. Honoring God ought to be the single foremost goal in your life and in mine. If we'd forget everything else and just every day with every decision that's made, ask the question, does this honor the Lord? 